good to go. Cool. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Corey Hickson. I'm going to be doing a look at the game Beam Saber um, as part of my Let's Talk RPG series that I'm doing. And uh, this game is coming out on Kickstarter on Monday, so pretty cool. Uh, with that in mind, we are going to be looking at not the final version obviously because they, they still have their Kickstarter to do and get that put together um, but the author was kind enough to provide me with a copy to take a look at and I'm super excited to jump into it. Um, I'm going to be looking at I think probably some of the stuff that's different for the most part from a Forge in the Dark game. Hey welcome to the stream. Um, yeah uh, I have not played a mech game before, and I have listened a little bit to a podcast of one. Um, so I know sort of like the general premise. Uh, I haven't seen any of the touchstones that I can think of. Like, well, maybe I've seen a little bit. But I haven't seen um, the big one being Gundam and the other one, um, I think, was Evangeline or the two sort of most well-known ones. Um, so I'm going into this a little bit um, learning about the aesthetic as well as the game. But I'm super familiar with Forged in the Dark, which this game is based off of. So going to have some familiar things there. Um, this is... The, the the PDF that I have is the whole game. Um, I'm probably going to go through parts of it and skim through different parts because it's over 300 pages long, so we've got a lot of ground that we can cover. I'm probably going to hone in on a few specific parts so that we can get like the gist of the game, understand some of the key parts, and how that works. And yeah, so with that in mind, let's hop in. Um, first things first, I really like the cover. It's cool, it's evocative, it tells me what's going on, and it's very characteristic of what I imagine the rest of the game is going to be. Um, like the font choice, it's cool, and yeah, so let's keep going. Uh, okay, so we've got some credits. Um, yep, it's based off of Blades in the Dark or the Forge in the Dark um, series. Um, cover art is by Vincent Patrick. I don't know them, but I like the cover art, so that's cool. Ooh, um, Ray Berry did sensitivity reading. That is cool. I like, I think this is the first time that I've actually seen that um, in the credits that I can remember. I may have missed it in other ones, but that is awesome. I like that. <laughs> and then play testers. Um, to do. I recognize a name in there, but that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so they got a bit of stuff for playtesters. Um, table of contents. Okay, let's see what's in here and maybe pick a few things that we're going to look at. How many pages of the table of contents? Who Nelly, the table of contents is it's, is a lot of stuff. Okay, we've got the basics. Out of the basics, I think we'll look at some of the things like the setting, how the players and the pilots work. We'll probably take a quick look at the touchstones. Um, I think I'll skip over a lot of the mechanics that we see in Forged in the Dark. So it looks like they have some new things in here, like armor and spark. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at some of the differences. The pilots, I'm curious, that's one thing I want to like jump into. Awesome. And then they have the playbook, so that's... Oh cool, we'll get to see all the playbooks as we go through this book. That's nice, I like that. Um, after the playbooks, we have the principles. I will say this table of contents is very in-depth. It feels like it's almost too in-depth, but maybe it's helpful. I, um, that would sort of depend to me on how it actually feels when you're playing. 
Mm -hmm. So we'll maybe take a quick look at the player's principles. There's a section here on fiction first gaming. I like that. Um, some stuff on looks like more mechanics-y things. The squads and the faction, so that's probably similar to the crew. I'm curious to see how that works and how that looks. Then they have the squad playbooks. That's nice. I like to look at those. They have the GM section. Ooh, they have a section here on session zero, including um, tools and stuff, safety tools. That's nice. I really like that. So big kudos there. And then they have some sections on crafting. I think for the GM section, I'll maybe go over it briefly. It looks like they have a bit here on factions that you can make as far as um, making an autocracy, a corporatocracy, democracy, oligarchy, theocracy, or corruption is a thing here, I guess. That's neat, I like that. Oops, skipped a, skipped a page. Um, ooh, they have a section here on starting situations. I like that. And then they have a bunch of example regions. I'll see how far I get into that setting stuff. It looks like they have a whole section on setting. I'll probably read just like the gist of it so I can learn a little bit about it. Um, they have some example vehicles because vehicles I imagine are going to be a pretty big thing in this. And then they have some stuff on alternate rules here. Ooh, and then random generation. I, I honestly really enjoy like looking at random generation tables and seeing what's available on them. Cool. Okay, a whole bunch of player resources. I like this. They've got the playbooks, character sheets, squad playbooks, squad sheets. And I'm curious what the difference is between the pilot playbooks and the pilot character sheets. Um, random tables, basics, pilot creation, vehicle creation. Okay, so lots of lots of great um, player resources. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it looks like they have some cool stuff set up for roll twenty, so that's nice. And then they have a change log. Okay, so introduction stuff out of the way. Let's get to the actual contents of the game. Um, they have like a brief introduction to the game itself, the setting. Let's read a little bit about the setting and see what sort of what some of the things are we can expect. Centuries after the majority of humanity abandoned a rotting earth blighted by their follies, the Isian conflict seeds are planted deep in space. Okay, the Exodus ships left humanity's cradle in varying states of quality and completion. Ships failed, were raided or cannibalized, and jettisoned all but the essentials. History, art, and all play and play all fell in the face of necessity. After the Exodus, five faction rose to power as ships fled in all directions across space. I like this so far. Each faction seeks authority over humanity and how it is directed. An autocracy uses its military might to put together other leaders to put others under its leader's sway. Okay, so that's a little bit on the different factions. Long into the war between these factions for control, it was realized that one of the backwater planets in conflict was probably Earth. Change from the calamitous intervening years is now mostly healed by its respite from humanity's swarm. It would be a great symbolic victory for the faction that conquered the planet, but other more valuable worlds to, uh, continue to be the focus of the war. A dense cloud of orbital debris surrounds Earth. Preventing constant satellite survival and easy travel between the ground and stars, intermittent space combat around the planet and throughout the system complicates this further. A handful of space elevators provide the best access to space, but only one remains in the hands of the planet's inhabitants. Con commonly called independence, there are millions of people who lived on Earth before the war found the planet. Regardless of if this planet really is humanity's birthplace, it is Earth to them and their home. Across the planet, they resist the off-worlders, their organizations, and their war in many different ways. Much of that resistance has gathered in the Isia region, where the last independent space elevator stretches into space. As the Isian conflict seizes, about to boil over, this is where you come in. Cool. Okay, so a nice sort of fighting for Earth, you know, galaxy explosion kind of stuff stuff going on way in the future okay i like that and then we have 
the pilots, so let's see what the different kinds of pilots are. We have aces, so the driver's bureaucrats, empaths, so compassionate psych psychics, I like that. Um, that I'm imagining is going to be sort of the magically fantasy part of it. There's the diplomats and spies. We have some subversive professionals as hackers, infiltrators, or stealthy operators. We have officers, so those are calculating tacticians, scouts, pathfinders, and snipers, soldiers, terrifying infantrymen, infantrymen and technicians, so the chemists, mechanics, and biologists. So my first hunch is like it looks like there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence to what we see in Blades in the Dark except I think um, Aces is new but once we get to the playbooks we can take a look then we have the vehicles let's see what we have in here there's the squad so um, the pilot are part of a squad um, so this is your group character sheet. You have spies in politics. Um, you have the kind that grinds the enemy to the dust. You have the kind that delivers goods. Okay, so really similar to what we see, again, for the crews. Okay. And it looks like some commentary on how to get started. Oh, and it has some nice touchstones. I'm going to take a look at these because I'm not familiar with um, a lot of them. Ah, okay, I am actually familiar with one of these. So this one, the Friends at the Table Season 2 Counterweight, that's the one podcast that I've listened to a little bit, and it's a mech noir um, game. So that's, that's cool. TV series, we've got Gundam in here, um, a bunch of other ones I'm not familiar with. Movies, ooh, Mad Max Fury Road, I know that one. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay, so making the game your own. Ah, for those that are familiar with Blades in the Dark, so since that's me, I'm going to check out this and see what it says about the similarities so I can make some more, so I can zoom in on the stuff that's actually different. Uh, if you're coming to Beam Saber after having played uh, Blades in the Dark or other Forge in the Dark games, this section is for you. It, le it lists some of the less obvious but important differences between the two. That's exactly what I need. So the vehicles, every pilot gets a vehicle, which is a massive war machine the size of a house. Even at their smallest, there's an immense difference in scale between a person and one of these monsters. Pilots can still affect them, but often requires explosive action to do so, and the blowback can be terrible. That said, there will be obstacles at both the pilot scale and the vehicle scale. That's cool, I like that. Not everything can be solved by having your giant robot step on someone. The goal of the pilot is generally not to retire to a life of luxury, though it can be, by acquiring wealth. Instead, they pursue something about the state of the world that they want to change, working towards what gives them drive resource. Okay, so rather than trying to retire rich, you're trying to complete your drive. Um, pushing yourself in collateral dice. In Beam Saber, a character can push themselves or their vehicle for uh, an extra dice or improved effect. That's similar. They can also take a collateral die. This is the game's equivalent of a devil's bargain for the same benefit. However, in Beam Saber, player may, be, player may do both on the same roll. They pay the cost for both, and so they get the benefits of both. So in Blades of the Dark, you couldn't do both, but in this one, it seems like they have a, a way to do both. Um, vehicle quirks. Vehicles don't have stress. Instead, they use quirks when pushing themselves or resisting consequences. Oh, okay. So I'm curious to see, like, do you have two character sheets? I think that would be neat. To spend a quirk when pushing or resisting, the player must say how they use the description of the quirk to gain its benefit. Further, there are no dice ruled when resisting with quirks. The pilot just spends the appropriate amount. Lastly, quirks are never spent when assisting another pilot or for flashbacks. Okay. Downtime, to assist with maintaining the health of the pilots and their vehicles. Okay, so it sounds like there are, you get two playbooks. You get three downtime activities for free during the downtime phase. So previously it used to be only two. It looks like you get an extra one basically to help you take care of your, your um, vehicle that you've got. Assisting and cutting loose. The amount of stress that a pilot has to spend when assisting another pilot varies. 
Each pilot will have a clock representing their relationship for each other pilot. The more full that clock is, the more stress it costs to assist them, but they also get more benefits. The clock fills by taking the cut loose downtime activity with that pilot, which also removes stress. Okay, so it looks like there's a cool bonding mechanic, which is neat. Um, Blades in the Dark, I don't, th it didn't have all that much for bonds, um, so that's neat to see uh, a, a little bit more, hopefully, to keep the players interacting with each other. Um, neat. And last but not least, the other big difference is repairing vehicles. So to remove damage from a vehicle, the repair downtime activity must be performed. Unlike the recovery downtime activity, the pilot repairing the vehicle is the same person who must spend their downtime activity, not the pilot is who is having their vehicle repaired. Okay. So a minor difference from what we see in Blades in the Dark. Cool. So the core system... I'm not going to go into details in this. Um, if folks want to learn more about Forge in the Dark, you can go to bladesinthedark.com. It has the basic rules there. Um, I'm going to keep going. It's got the clocks here. Clocks are a great mechanic. I'm going to save that for um, another time. Basically, you have these clocks. You can fill them up to represent progression, and you can have them represent a bunch of different narrative things. Um, position. Uh, this is super similar, again, to Blades in the Dark. We have controlled, risky, and desperate, and that's going to inform what happens with the consequences of the action if you aren't totally successful. Um, and then it looks like, you know, when you take a desperate action, you also get one XP. Familiar stuff. Cool. And it's got some stuff here on what the consequences can be. Um, it talks about the different opportunities that you can give. Cool. So very familiar stuff with Blades in the Dark. I'm just going to keep... Okay, Armor and Spark. So this looks like a new section here. Let's check this out. When a pilot or vehicle suffers consequences, they can reduce the impact by spending an appropriate armor. Okay, so this is familiar to Blades in the Dark. Um, boom, boom, boom. For pilots, the standard gear armor grants one per mission, and heavy armor grants an additional one for a total of two per mission. Um, pilot armor and heavy armor can only be taken once each. For vehicles, the standard gear armor grants one use per mission. Yep. Um, okay, so I'm curious to see what this spark section is, as the armor is the same same idea. Okay, so most armor only protects against physical harm or damage, but some abilities such as the Infiltrator's Shadow work on non-injury threats. These abilities are activated by spending a pilot's spark through ticking its box on the character sheet. Oh, okay. Oh, this is your special armor. Once the spark is spent, it can't be used again until the beginning of the next mission. Uh, if the pilot has lost more than one ability that uses spark, Let's see here. Only one of those... Um, oh, if the pilot has more than one ability that uses spark, you can only use one per mission. Okay. Um, so that's that's the special armor that we saw before. And then we have effect. Um, you can you know have your uh, lower effect, standard effect, greater effect. I'm going to keep going because this is familiar Blades in the Dark stuff. You have your gathering information. Gameplay cycle. Cool. So it's still very similar looking. <laughs> okay, let's take a quick look and see if there's anything different about um, pilot creation. Uh, you choose your playbook. You get three starting action points. Okay, and then you get one based off of who you were before the war. How has your pilot experienced the cost of war? This is your tragedy. Okay, so that seems new. That's cool. Add some backstory to your character. What were you doing before you joined the squad but after your tragedy? Oh, okay, so it looks like you have 
some points that you divvy up between your pilot and your vehicle or which ones. What do you hope to change in the world? This is your drive. So that sounds like your vice. Um, assign three points by dividing them among the vehicle actions. Okay, put two points. You will now have a total of 10 total action points. So between both playbooks, you get 10 total. Interesting. Uh, choose an ability from your playbook. Nice. Uh, write your name, pronouns, call sign, and look. I like that they include pronouns. I feel like that's just a thing that King should include as a standard going forward. Write the names of each of the other members of your squad on your connection sheet. Okay. I like that. I'm curious to see how the connection sheet looks. Create one belief you have about each pilot or choose an example belief. Hmm. Curious to see what those look like. Okay, so now we're getting into some new stuff specifically for this game. The war has affected everyone with the lucky only having rationing in their lives, but many more have experienced some form of tragedy. Tragedy. The pilots are not solely tragic figures, though. They have a history before the war stole from them, and they find ways to live before they join the squad where the story opens for them. One thing I noticed just uh, as I'm reading this, the reading feels... Mm, It doesn't read in the same way that I usually speak. Um, just a interesting thing I've noticed. It takes me a second to put the right enunciation on the right things as I'm going through it. Uh, when choosing your pilot's history, tragedy, and opening, there's no need to have it fully fleshed out. Having just a single detail for each is enough because developing the character through play and discovering who they are is a part of the game. Really like that. For every person who, you know, has just labored over this intensive backstory with everything filled out, it's like, I wish they could just do this always, especially in other games where it's like, you don't need everything. Just pick like one detail and leave the rest to figure it out, you know, as it makes sense in the game. I like that a lot. Uh, it also leaves room to learn that other player characters are part of your past. I like that. If you do have a lot of backstory ideas that you're very happy with, keep them. Just keep an open mind about including new details as the game progresses. Love that. A pilot's history is who they were before the tragedy. Generally, this is a fairly mundane existence where the war is not something that fills their thoughts. Sure, there's rationing, the neighbor's kids got conscripted, and your second cousin is moving back in with their parents after the space station they lived on got destroyed, but you can go on most days without thinking about things like that. So don't worry about the tragedy looming in your future, because for now, life is normal. When a pilot's history is expressed during play, they will get experience at the end of the session. So some example ones, I like that they include examples. You can be academic, art, criminal entertainment, family, labor, law, military, political, spiritual, trade. Cool. And then um, tragedies. A pilot's tragedy is the event that propels them into their involvement in the war. So that's... I. It's really popular, I find, in games today. I, I Honestly, not just today, like for tabletop games in all of history as we know it, to use tragedy to push your characters forward. I like that they're just codifying it and being like, you know what, you're going to have a tragic backstory. We're just going to use that. So I think that's kind of fun. Uh, it might be the loss of loved ones being targeted by accusations or witnessing an atrocity. It might not put them immediately into a squad, but it does put them on a course where every day they get closer to the controls of a war machine. When a pilot's tragedy is expressed during play, they will get XP at the end of the session. And then there's some example ones here, which um, I like that. That's cool. And then opening. So I'm curious to see what this is. I, I really like how they've added a little bit more to character creation. Um, I almost want to, one thing I'm really interested to see is how those bond mechanics work, because that's one thing from Blades of the Dark where I'm sort of like, hmm, 
what what would be good for player interaction there. Okay, so let's see what this, this opening is about. Um, a pilot's opening is what they were doing uh, before they joined the squad. It is what they did with themselves between the tragedy and the opening of the game. Some will be in a deep depression, possibly at the bottom of a bottle. Others will be training hard to get their revenge. A few will try to continue with their lives, pretending that their fate is not irrevocably changed and pulling them towards the war. All will be forced into a new life at the start of the game. Cool. When a pilot's opening is expressed during play, they get XP at the end of the session. And then we have some cool examples there. Okay, and then we have the actions. So let's take a look and see what actions we have here. So we have hunt, study, survey, engineer. Seems pretty familiar. Excuse me. We have our prowess actions, finesse, prowl, struggle, wreck. Pretty similar again. And then we have some resolve ones. Okay, we've got com command, Consort interface for using complex digital equipment, so hacking and such, that's cool, and sway. Super similar to Blades in the Dark, um, but you know, those are solid, tried and true actions that work, so I like that. And then for your character, you pick a drive. What do you want to change? Regardless of how they ended up in the war, every pilot has an ambition. Um, maybe they want to get revenge on the squad that destroyed their village, so on and so forth. The ability to make changes are represented by a drive and two four tick clocks. The drive is a sentence that briefly explains what the pilot hopes to change in the world. When a pilot does something new that furthers their drive, they can add one tick to a drive clock at the end of the mission as part of the reward process. That's interesting. I like the idea of reward clocks. If they complete a long-term project that furthers their drive, they can add one tick to a drive clock in addition to the normal benefits of completing that project. Cool. Um, you can also get drive ticks by calling in favors from your patron faction or other squads. To do this, you must have a relationship with your patron of plus one or higher or a plus three status with another squad. Um, okay, oh, here's a nice thing. If, you cho if you've chosen a drive that seems too big or too amorphous to affect, it is all right to get drive ticks for relatively small actions. For example, if your drive is to remove orbital debris cloud, you can get a tick by suggesting that salvage squad could turn a profit by taking the cloud apart. Uh, the one thing drives can't do is end the war. There are too many pressures from too many sources for one person or one squad to stop it. You might be able to shift the nature of the war, however, by changing how or why it is fought. See Spending Drive for more details. And then they have some nice examples. Kill the man responsible for destroying my hometown. Defeat your rival. Learn his weakness. Find out where he sleeps. Become a famous pop idol. Build a horse ranch away from the war. Okay. Cool. I would like to see a little bit more on like how to write a good drive. The examples are helpful, but what's what's the like key part there? Okay, and then you can spend your drive, which is cool. Once a drive clock is full, it can be spent to change the world. The more clocks spent at once, the bigger the change. This is interesting. Spend one clock to negate harm or damage of any level. Change an action or fortune roll to a six, or assist another per pilot by providing all four benefits. That's cool. Spend two clocks to change the life circumstances of one person. This is the only way to permanently defeat a rival. That's cool. Um, three clocks to destroy, uh, change the circumstances of a squad. Four clocks to change the circumstances of a faction. Cool. As a pilot, you can only have two drive clocks. More than one pilot must spend drive to change the circumstances of a squad or faction, so you have to work collaboratively. That's cool. Um, nice. I think that sort of gives us the gist of it. And then you choose your um, pilot name, call sign, and pronouns. Hmm. 
I like that they include a part here where they just lay this out. Regardless of how you use your pronouns, you need to respectfully use the correct pronouns of the players and characters at the table. I like it. <laughs> okay, pilot looks. We can skip over that. And then connections. I'm curious to see how this works. The ties between pilot and his squad are as diverse as those between family. Sometimes they're intense, heated, and asymmetrical. What? Other times they are cool, cordial, and mutual. These connections determine how stressful it is and competent you are when you need to assist your fellows. On your pilot's character sheet, there will be a separate, separate four tick clock for each other pilot in your squad by presenting your relationship with that pilot. For each tick in that clock, make a belief about the pilot um, the clock is tied to. Okay. I'm curious to see how that looks. When the clock fills, ask the target pilot for a truth about one of the beliefs tied to them. Then reset it to one tick as you see them in a new light. It'll take time and effort to understand them again and relearn their rhythms. So the pilot erases all the beliefs they have for that pilot and writes a new one related to the truth just learned. After they reveal the truth about themselves, you both take one XP, which can be put into any attribute or into the pilot playbook. Okay, it seems a, a bit heavy, um, but I think I would need to try it out and, ex and see how that works. Um, it's just sort of my first impression looking at that. Okay, beliefs. Mm -hmm. I like that they include a bit here where they have some examples where it's like, hey, here's some beliefs that you can have. Blades in the Dark has a section for beliefs, but it doesn't like write it out or anything. Um, and that's always something that I've wanted is to make that a bit more explicit. Cool. And then we have stress. Uh, I'm going to move over stress because that's a forged in the dark mechanic. Uh, looks like you have scars instead of trauma. Do do do. Cool. And then some more, you know, familiar Forge in the Dark stuff. It looks like you have rivals. Um, it looks like this expands on it from what you have. In Blades in the Dark, you have a friend and a enemy. This is interesting. Okay, so it looks like some there's some mechanics around rivals. Then you have your allies. Mm -hmm. I like that they add a little bit more structure to, to that feature of the game. Okay, and then you have your different advancement. You have playbook advancement, attribute advancement, and general XP. And then it talks a little bit about how you can add more pilots. Talks a little bit about PvP and it goes over the actions. The only one that's new is interface, so let's just see what that says. When you interface, you work closely with electronic equipment, making an extension of your body. You might hack into a technologically advanced vehicle or understand how it works. In a flashback, you might have tricked an enemy's vehicle into updating its operating system when it was next started. You could disable a vehicle's force field, but battle might be better. Cool. And then we have some pilot gear. Okay, anything new in here? Looks like a lot of, you know, similar stuff that we would expect to see. Ooh, a parachute. I like that. Cool. And then we can jump in and take a look at the different playbooks. Um, 
I think what I'll do for these playbooks, I'll take a look at some of them. I'll probably take a look at this, the ace. I'll probably take a look at the psychic one. And then I'll maybe see if there's another one or two that I'm interested in. Okay, so the ace is a graceful and daring pilot, so they get maneuver and engineer. At the end of a session, they take XP if they address a challenge with piloting or violence. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I wasn't expecting the violence part to be in there. Um, your ace specialist vehicle gear, it looks like you get some gear specs just for your vehicle, that's cool. And then you have some abilities, adaptable. You may spend your spark to make up to two points of your vehicle's load undeclared or to push yourself in a vehicular maneuver. More than meets the eye. Your custom vehicle has the ability to transform into a secondary form. Ooh. Detail that second form. Select two load worth of vehicle gear of three points of action ratings that your vehicle has. It lacks this gear in action ratings when it's in its secondary form. This seems a bit complex, but here we are. Select two load worth of vehicle gear and three points of action reading that your vehicle lacks. Um, it has this gear in action ratings when it's in a secondary form. Okay, so you can switch forms. That seems tricky to manage. I'm curious how that works in playtesting and how that's come across. <laughs> okay, so you've got some cool abilities. You have your gathering information. Ooh, starting beliefs. Let's take a look at what some of the options are. Um, they handle their vehicle very badly, lol. They don't understand my value as a pilot. They are going to get someone killed. I better keep an eye on them. They desire glory as much as I do. We'll make history. So it looks like those are what you can put with your other players, if I'm understanding that correctly. And then it has some nice example starting builds. That's good. Um, I'll just reiterate that this is a early copy, so we don't have a lot of the art and formatting that's gonna happen once once the Kickstarter goes through and is finished. Okay, we have the bureaucrat. Oh, ooh, here it is. I'm gonna take a look at the empath a little bit. I wanna see how they do stuff. Um, ooh, a note on the empath and consent. Love that they included this in here. I feel like they've done a very good job of laying out some important but really sort of basic table etiquette stuff and sort of like include explicitly how to be respectful with these things. Hmm. Okay, so the empath has study and survey. Interesting. I'm guessing their special abilities is what sort of lets them do stuff further. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at some of their specialist gear. So they have inspiring appearance, an item or various details that make your ver vehicle a symbol to those who see it, a broadcast system, a psionic amplifier. Okay, empath abilities, telepathy. You can freely communicate directly to a person's mind as though speaking normally if you've previously had a revealing interaction with them. Um, additionally, when you're part of a group action, you can spend one stress per participant, including the leader, to let everyone participate in that action use the leader's action rate instead of their own. Two parts going on there, that's interesting. Um, this reminds me of what's her name from Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm having a brain fart, but I, I've seen that whole series and I can't remember. Is it Was it Diana? Anyways, um, it runs me of the empath. Broadcast, farsight, emoji. 
You know the secret method to interact with an app or AI as if it was a normal human, regardless of how corrupted or rampant it appears. Okay. Everybody hurts. You may spend your spark to resist a consequence from ambushes or to push yourself to understand others. Oh, this is interesting. You can push yourself after you see the result of an action roll or assist after an ally's action roll if no one else assisted them. When you have a personal moment with someone, you can take any amount of stress up to your max stress to heal that person the same amount of stress. That would be very handy for the downtime phase. You could have an intimate moment with someone, take their like one stress here, one stress there, and then do your roll to, to de-stress. Interesting. We have some allies and rivals. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. These are the playbooks. Very cool. Like it. I like what I'm seeing. Some of it so far is a little bit... I feel like it still has to come together a bit, but that could be because there's still playtesting and stuff going on, so not really too worried about that. Um, I'm curious to see going forward the vehicles and the squads because so far we haven't gotten into a lot of the like nitty gritty mech stuff so I think it'll be cool to see how that works. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Okay, so that's the player playbooks, the player principles. Um, I think I'm going to go through this briefly. I don't think I'll say too much on these. Player principles are great. Love to see them in books. Mm, advocate for the scenes you want. This is a nice one. There will be times where you'll imagine an interesting scene that you think would benefit the narrative. Sometimes they'll happen on their own as the pieces fall into place, but a far more reliable way to have those scenes happen is for you to advocate for them. Talk to the GM about setting up scenes with NPCs you want to roleplay with. Cool. I like that they they just lay it out, ask for the things you want. Build your character through play, hustle to get ahead. Break the rules with long-term projects. Mm, that's a good one. Long-term projects are a great way to do things that you wanted to do but weren't given, you know, a straightforward way otherwise. Ooh, act now, plan later. Mmm, one of the reasons why I love Forged in the Dark games. Um, there's a little bit on Fiction First Gaming. I think I'll move over this. Fiction First Gaming, love it, love to see it. The vehicles, cool. More nitty gritty stuff that I want to check out. Beam Saver is about pilots and their massive war machines. Vehicle creation, okay, let's see what's going on here. Choose the look of your vehicle and its model and manufacturer. Um, choose your vehicle's load, but don't detail what gear it has at the time. Choose four quirks for your vehicle. So it can be bipedal, it can, oh my gosh, arm tentacles. Tentacle arms. Very cool. I like these options. If you mix and match them, you could get like a bunch of different aesthetics. I like that. Hmm. Vehicle actions. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Okay, so for the vehicles, we have a whole different set of actions. We've got battle, destroy, maneuver. Bombard, manipulate, and scan. Okay. Hmm. Uh, 
Um, quirks quirks are the unique qualities a vehicle possesses that a pilot familiar with it can use to their advantage. However, these quirks aren't wholly positive. If all of them are expended without maintenance, the vehicle will suffer a breakdown. Okay. Every vehicle starts with four quirks that the pilot is already familiar with. These first four quirks are likely common to the model of that vehicle. Up to four additional for a total of eight can be gained by filling the enhanced track with the enhanced downtime activity. And these ones are unique to this specific vehicle. Each quirk has two descriptors that determine when the quirk can be used. These descriptors show how the pilot can push the vehicle in just the right way to get more out of it than designed for. For example, a vehicle might have roaring fast and it can be pushed, pushed for more speed or noise. Um, when selecting your descriptors, make sure at least one of them can be interpreted as a disadvantage because struggling due to your quirks provides XP at the end of your session. Okay, um, four feels like a good amount to manage. I feel like eight might be overwhelming, but I'm curious to see, again, how that comes out in play. Um, yeah. That'd be interesting to see in that case. I kind of get the impression that quirks are a pretty important part of that piloting vehicle gameplay. Ah, some example quirks. Mighty clumsy, light-footed, common parts, redundant systems, flexible structure, ominous appearance. Okay. A pilot can push their vehicle by exhausting a quirk for one of the following benefits. Um, extra die, improved effect, or take an action when you've already taken level 3 damage. Um, when a vehicle's quirks have all been exhausted, four quirks in most cases, you can either send the vehicle limping home quietly or try to push it past its limits. Um, bu -bu -bum. You can grant a... Okay, so we've got two parts here. If the pilot chooses to send their vehicle away, it refreshes all quirks, is removed from the scene and mission in a terrible state, then gains a breakdown tick. The pilot does not have to leave the scene or mission. The vehicle becomes available again at appropriate time, presumably after it has been refueled and polished. If the pilot pushes their vehicle past its limits, they take a dire action. If a dire action is taken, the pilot can ignore any damage penalties the vehicle currently has for a single action. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so some stuff going on there. This feels... I, again, this is something I think I would need to try in play to see how it goes. Um... Yeah, I like the idea of the quirks. I like how you use them. Oh, there's more. Interesting. Okay. Um, then we have damage going on here. So this um, is probably laid out on the character sheet as well. So and it's similar to Blades in the Dark. It looks like it. Uh, you can have a breakdown. A breakdown is permanent damage to the vehicle where only symptoms can be treated. Each time a vehicle gains a point of breakdown, the last quirk used must be degraded in some way to represent the systems. Oh, here's an example. Okay, this is what I need. I need some examples, and they've got one here. Pitchfork has pushed her agrarian custom past its limits, and it has gained a point of breakdown. The final quirk she used was slow and heavy, so that's the one that has to be degraded. She considers making that quirk into slow, clumsy, and heavy, but ultimately decides to go with unresponsive and heavy. Interesting. <laughs> hmm. I think this is an interesting piece where it looks like they tried to balance between like fiction first and mechanical pieces. I'm curious to see how, again, this actually comes together in the game. Mm -hmm. I think my like initial impression is um, there might be some improvements made as playtesting goes on, 
but it could be the case where like it really sings and it's just something you have to to try out and play and to get there and then you have your load um, similar to Blades in the Dark Mm -hmm. um, looks like they've just got some more stuff on the vehicles again I'm gonna be going over some of this stuff quicker and diving into certain things that I actually want to you know dissect the squads and factions okay let's see how this works mm. okay let's see how squad creation goes let's dive into this um, choose your squad's patron faction the faction will determine what bonus supplies you get for completing missions okay and what goal your faction is working on and then you have you you can have your autocracy corporatocracy democracy independent oligarchy and theocracy uh, set your relationship with each faction to zero uh, at the start they don't know or care about your squad create an NPC who is the direct superior of the squad this is someone that the GM can often use to assign the squad missions and who the squad will have a, good, uh, a connection to for good or ill one squad is friendly with the direct superior so take uh, plus one status with them and describe the connection. Another squad dislikes the direct superior. Take minus one status and describe that issue. Okay, interesting. Choose a goal for your patron faction. Some of the options include assault the foe, divided they fall, golden streets, hearts and minds, hostile takeover, intelligence coup, manufacture heroes, secure the borders. I'm not quite sure what some of these are. Um, like what is hearts and minds about? Like you want to affect the hearts and minds of people? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Choose your squad playbook. Cool. Choose a squad ability. Choose two upgrades, name your squad. Okay, similar to Blades in the Dark. You know, those are all things that we see see in Blades in the Dark. Squad advancement. Um, cool. Okay, so they have a direct superior. I'm curious to see how that works. Like... One thing I like about Blades in the Dark is it makes you motivate yourself to like do things. It's like, oh yeah, we want to go get this. We want to go do these things. And it's a nice group discussion within the crew. Having a direct superior, I can definitely see some players being like, oh, let's go chat with them, get our next mission. Whereas I think I would, I think I prefer this sort of the group chats about different things and that kind of stuff hmm. cool and then you pick some stuff for your operation forward operating base okay so you have a base yep cool oh and then a bunch of upgrades Okay. Ah, this is your stress for your crew, it looks like. Heart is an abstraction of the support and control the squad has in the areas they administer and operate in. This provides stability to the squad's rep, meaning that fewer rep points are acquired. Do do do. Oh, okay. That's similar to hold then in Blades in the Dark. Then you have your cohorts. I'm not going to go through the details of cohorts. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of squad development because that's, again, similar to crew. Doo -doo -doo. Mm -hmm -hmm. 
all similar stuff to Blades in the Dark here. We've got our downtime activities. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do is I think I'm gonna keep going through these. Um, again, quickly, I'd like to get to the squad playbooks. Oh, there it is, we're, we're at them. Let's take a look and see what we have here for playbooks. We have the consulate, $10 words. The war complicates everything, especially communication. The right gesture, sound, or look can launch a thousand ships. Hmm. Um, who was the one that could launch a thousand ships with their, with their face? I think it was Troy. Is that who it was? Anyways, you've got the skills to gesture those ships to the right place at the right time. Starting upgrades, insight training quarters. Let's see what some of these abilities are. Silver tongue, so an extra action rating between command, consort, or sway. Accord, sometimes friends are as good as public support. You may count up to three plus three squad and or faction statuses you hold as if they're heart. High society, it's all about who you know. Take plus one trust during downtime with your patron faction or hiring faction and plus one dice to gather info about the region's elites. Okay, so, mm -mm -mm. looks like this is a lot of stuff to do with the advancement and your downtime. It feels very mechanical, which is cool. Usually I find that the, um, the crew or the squad one is more mechanical based. And then you can get some upgrades here. Cool. Mm -hmm. We have the profiteers, so everything of the price, the powerful take and the weak buy. Ooh. We're just doing capitalism at this point now. Very interesting. Hmm, okay, the squads seem pretty straightforward, pretty similar again to Blades in the Dark. Um, I like that, I mean, might as well, you know, keep a good thing good. You don't need to fix a, something if it's not broken. Um, then we have the GM goals. So the goals here for the GM are play to find out what happens, very powered by the apocalypse, like that. Fill the world with detail, interesting, yep. Convey the world honestly and ensure everyone at the table is safe. Oh cool, that's a very nice principle, or goal rather. I like that. It is ultimately, in my opinion, the GM's responsibility to do that stuff. So that I, I like that they include that in here. Um, explicitly. Cool. Okay, and let's take a look at some of the GM principles. Be a fan of the pilots. Let everything flow from the fiction. Address the pilots. Address the players. Fill the world with inequality. Interesting. Make the war the enemy, not the soldiers. Make the war too big to defeat. I like that one. War is, you know, is the core concept of this setting. So if, if I feel like that's something you really got to lean into and be like, it's so big, there's so much going on. That is the stew pot that you're in and always will be in. Make the pilots feel small and the vehicles feel powerful. Sort of the idea that, you know, if you have a person standing here and then you have your mech who's like... <sighs> Consider the risk and hold on lightly. Cool. And then we have some GM actions. Session zero. I'm curious to see, this is, this is some new content compared to Blades in the Dark, so let's see what they have a, a bit in here. 
Um, before the first session, when the first mission happens, the players need to have their session zero. A session zero is the foundation for a campaign. It builds both the narrative and, more importantly, the social foundations of the game. This section has steps to follow for laying those foundations. Beam Saber is designed to tell the harsh tale of people trying to physically and emotionally survive in all but in an all-encompassing war, but it is still a game, excuse me, and games are supposed to be fun. Nothing ruins a person's fun faster than being exposed to emotionally charged situations that they did not agree to experience, regardless of if they are a player or GM. This is where lines, veils, and the X cards come in. Love this. I like that they go in and talk about the session zero, how to include these things. I like that they, oh, they've got a link here. Perfect. They explain them. They talk about expectations. Some very practical things in here. Really enjoy this. This is something that I'm like, yep, we love to see it in our games. Talks about some, you know, really straightforward things. How long should each session be? How many sessions would everyone like to play in the campaign? When can people schedule sessions? Hmm. And then you create your characters in the squad. Very nice. Cool. And then it goes on to talk about creating factions and stuff. Okay, so I think I'm trying to remember what the next section is that I want to go through. Oh, interesting. They have this section here on app development. Let's take a look at this. Apps are programs with a limited scope of skills, but the capability to act and react on its own without oversight. This narrow focus and freedom of action often results in entities obsessed with fulfilling their programming when they aren't properly developed. Many incautious developers experience grievous injuries at the hands of an app fulfilling its purpose in an unexpected manner. Their serious undertaking is generally only created by organizations with significant resources and are highly regulated within most factions. A rare few apps occur naturally as programs, proxies, or AI change over time into something new. The line between the four can become blurred. Choosing to develop an app is to willingly expose yourself to an insidious force that may interpret even the best of intentions. So why develop one? Apps are extremely powerful since most physical spaces have digital elements to them, if not a full augmented reality overlay. They can bankrupt a CEO, shift a reactor into meltdown, or scour all social media to track a fugitive. The only way to completely avoid an app is to ensure all the technology nearby is analog and free of their manipulations. Good luck with that. Before an app can be de begin development, it requires a primordial code. A primordial code is a hard to come by due to its high manufacturing costs and tendency to absorb unintended influence when not properly isolated. Getting your hands on this code might be a reward for completing a mission, perhaps by working for a digital security squad. Alternatively, it can be done with a long-term project, so on and so forth. Hmm. This is neat. This is a new crafting element, it looks like, um, specific to this setting and what you are going to get out of this game. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Then they have some nice, you know, technologies that they include. Okay, they've got the starting situation. I like this. Um, I like that they include, like, hey, if you just want to kick off a game, here's something you can do. Mm, when to end a campaign. I like that they include some discussion like, here's how you want to wrap this up and end it. Cool. Okay, 
it looks like we're getting into some more of the setting related stuff. This is interesting to see. I think I'll take a little bit of a look at it. I felt like the introduction gave a very cohesive description of what this setting is. So I don't know if we need to dive into this. Actually, I think what we'll do is I'm probably going to skim through the rest of the, the game and then we'll hop over to some of the playbooks, squads, and look at some of the player resources that come with it because I think it'd be fun to check those out. Oh, nice. They have a cool map. <laughs> more map, more setting. It's nice to have that stuff. It's good inspiration. Oh my. That's scary. Hmm. I like the nice little art inserts they have here. Hmm. Okay, here's some good setting stuff. In Beam Saber, the physical space and the digital space have a nearly ubiquitous overlap known as augmented reality, or AR. Interacting with editing and programming digital tools has become important and common a skill as basic literacy and numeracy. The flow of digital information surrounds people going about their day through the vast majority of it, it isn't detectable to them. That which is visible can take many different forms. So it will lack any ability to apply kinetic force. Okay, so you have your AR world that you get to interact with. Do, do, do. Cool. And then you have your list of factions. You know, factions are factions. They are fun once you actually get into the game. They're really important. Um, you want them to be flavorful. Do, do, do. Cool. And then we have some appendix stuff. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We have some random pilot generation stuff. Do, 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 do. Some drives. Rival relationships. Hmm. Okay, so just a bunch of tables. Mm -hmm. And then some change log stuff. Okay. What I'm going to do, there's obviously a lot of content in here that we didn't actually get to cover and go over. I tried to do a lot of stuff that was new to this, but not new to Blades in the Dark, just because of, you know, time restrictions and what we're going to be able to do looking at this. I'm going to jump over now and I'm going to take some time in this to just get it set up we're going to do some live live work in stream labs do, 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 so that we can take a look at some of the other sheets that they have available Ta -da! okay so it looks like they've got the rules reference. I'm going to, again, keep an eye out for anything that is new or different here. Um, some of this writing is a little bit tough to read. The, um, the faded font mixed with the like normal font, I'm just from like a design point a little bit critical of.
<laughs> okay, so you have your squad upgrades. Bunch of your gear. Entanglements. So this is what happens when you complete a mission. The list is definitely longer. One thing I have noticed about this game is it seems to take a lot of the stuff that is in Blades of the Dark and expands it. I'm curious to see how that works out because one thing about Blades of the Dark is how streamlined it feels. Um, I, I would be a little bit worried that adding too much stuff would take away some of that streamlined feeling. Um, or alternatively, you just have more stuff to work with and you can pick and choose as you need. <laughs> you have your entanglements and then you have your downtime action. Okay, cool. Let's take a look at some of those squad sheets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a blank one. Okay, so here's a nice filled out one. So you have your squad sheet, name, reputation, um, your forward operating base has a lot of upgrades. I guess this is kind of what I mean by the, like, there's so much stuff that you can pick from. Interesting to see. Then you have your abilities here, you have your squad XP. Then you have specific squad upgrades. You have your trust, patron faction, direct superior. Okay, cool. And then it's just different abilities and upgrades that they go through and give you. This one only has one. Some of these only have one upgrade filled in. Interesting. Okay, and then we've got our playbooks for the pilots. Mm, okay. So you have your, on the top left, you've got your descriptive stuff, your harm, then you have your vehicle, so it's on the same page. That's interesting. Wasn't expecting that. I was expecting that to be a separate page. Mm -hmm. You have your damage. And then, okay, you've got some stuff for your mech down here. Interesting. Then your mech has a load. Where is our, where do our beliefs go with our, our bonds? Just taking a look for that. Is it not on this page? Oh, this is the pilot connection sheet. Hmm. Interesting. I don't like, I mean, I guess there's a lot going on. Hmm. This is sort of, I guess, the balance of do you add more and have it be good or do you try and streamline it and make it be quicker? I feel like an extra sheet. I really love that Blades in the Dark is like, boom, here's your playbook, one sheet, there you go. I wonder if it maybe would have been beneficial to take out some of the other things in place of this. Oh, interesting. And then the playbooks only start with one point. Give your drive up here. Hmm. Any of the regions. Cool. I'm going to hop back to this one. Very interesting game. I think my thoughts on it are that I would want to try it out. I'm not familiar with the mech aesthetic, 
So honestly, I'd probably want to have someone else guide me through it. That would be what's most comfortable for me. This is, of course, coming from someone who deals in fantasy a lot. But I think I could have a lot of fun playing it. I'm curious to see how some of the... It seems like there's a lot of things that are added on, like there's new stuff you can work with. Personally, I really liked how streamlined a lot of the other things are, so I'm curious to know if these additions take away from how streamlined things feel. I hope that's not the case, but I would need to play it to find out. Um, and yeah, overall, I think I really enjoy a lot of the work that's been put into this. It's very cool. Um, I think some final thoughts are if I just want to take Blades in the Dark uh, as a Forge in the Dark game and play it as a mech game, this would scratch that itch. I think this does it. I think it does what it's set out to do, so I like that. Really liked a lot of the inclusion of safety tools and setting up expectations it feels like this book is going to do that better than what i've seen a lot of books do um and then yeah i guess that's my my final thoughts on it um as of March 2nd, 2020, this will be on Kickstarter. I'll include a link in the description. So if you're interested, you can check it out there. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Austin for providing me a copy that I could check this out. Um, oh, uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, so to be clear, this is a modded version of game that exists part of a bigger series. So this is based off of a, or I'll do a quick, quick history lesson on what exactly this is, because that's close to it, but not quite. So originally there's a game that was released called Blades in the Dark, and they took that game and took the core system and said, hey, this is a reference document that anyone can use this core system and create their own game with. So this game was created using that core system. So I would say it's more of a sibling of the other games in the series, and it's also from a different publisher and author. So there's that. But the the core system is the same so like i could pick this game up and play it because i've played the other games and i'm familiar with them um yeah so i will wrap up there uh thanks everyone for checking this out uh, i hope you enjoyed it if you have any questions or anything or things that you would have wanted me to check out more let me know i'm always open to feedback and improving on that uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you for uh, joining me, and I hope everyone has a good uh, day, afternoon, evening, uh, whatever it is.